great. So, you know, this, this uh, program would not be in existence if it really wasn't for this strong learning model that, that we've been following for almost 30 years. Um, so it's my pleasure to, to present our next presenters, um, two individuals that continue to inspire and, and continue to push the lines of play through learning. Um, Natalie Rusk is a research scientist at the Lifelong Kindergarten Group at MIT Media Lab and also one of the lead developers for Scratch. Mitchell Resnick is the director of the Lifelong Kindergarten Group and an active board member of the Clubhouse Network. Please give it up for our co-founders, Mitchell Resnick and Natalie Rusk. Good morning, everyone. Did you all enjoy time at the party yesterday? <laughs> actually, I was going to start with the story at the, at the party. It was actually, I was having dinner with Natalie. And we finished up our dinner. I looked over, and there was a room where there was a lot of activity. And I told her, I said, well, that's probably where the dessert is. And I was sort of thought, go to dessert. So we went there, and then we saw it wasn't the dessert. It's where people were making masks. <laughs> and that made me really happy. First of all, that there was a place at the party for some, you know, some crafting, making activity. And then to be part of a community where there was so much bustling activity around that crafting, making activity you know, at, the, at the party. So it was great to see all the spirit around it at the party last night. Um, it was also nice at, at the party last night, Natalie and I got to spend more time uh, getting to know Lisa better. We talked with her for a while, and it's been great to get to know her better. And we sort of just are looking forward to work more closely with Lisa as she's getting started. We want to give her our warmest welcome. But at the same time, I want to give our deep gratitude to Gail as she finishes up. It was, you know, it was 30 years ago that Natalie and I started working on the clubhouse. Natalie was in a museum in Boston, the Computer Museum, and I was at MIT. And Natalie saw a real need for this, and we collaborated from MIT, helping out and working together. Uh, and the, the first clubhouse opened in 1993, and we were really excited about what happened, and it was you know, seeing all the great activity and the creative spirit that was growing in the community, you know, at the clubhouse. And we sort of had a vision and a dream that somehow, over time, this could expand and sort of there could be clubhouses in other places. But we knew we, knew we needed somebody to be helping with that if it was really going to, you know, take, take form. So we were so fortunate. I had known Gail, and uh, she made a big career change in order to shift over and to take over to grow the network. It's just been wonderful to work together over the last 27 years as it's grown into the unbelievable you know, global community that it's become. Uh, so actually, we do want to give a little token of our appreciation uh, to Gail. So Gail, if you could come up and join us. <laughs> So we're trying to think, I mean, how do you summarize? Really, it's like way beyond what it could have been. We said, oh, it's a model, but how could we ever have imagined this incredible community from around the world and all the work that you all do with young people and just watching Gail over the years to grow it? So we thought we made a little green table, because that's often how people gather. And it's a symbol of within the first clubhouse, there was a green table. But also, just like I see this as our big green table where we're all together. So, thank you, Gail, oh, so much. Well, you'll see the green table figure in, in in our comments today as we continue to you know, talk about things. Um, Actually, you know, I think we always love being at the annual conference because we get to learn so much from meeting with all of you, you know, at the annual conference and just to see all the different ways that people are you know, putting the clubhouse ideas into practice around the world. So it's this great opportunity. I know right after this, the, club, the, the project fair is one of our favorite times to hear what all of you yeah, are doing. Yeah, the first time, uh, the, the, I think it was one of, or the first clubhouse conference, when I came, I remember, Gavin from the clubhouse in Ireland, he's like, they're these principles of the clubhouse. Those sound great, but how do you actually put them into practice? And that's what really motivated me. But a lot of those first sessions were by the staff from the network, from MIT. And I think now, I would say, obviously, the heart of the whole conference is really all of you sharing your experience. And like the project fair is just a highlight for me. And then all the sessions that are offered, so many of them 
are you sharing your experience and within it? And that's really the heart of it now. So I find that so inspiring and so important. Yeah, and you know, I think so much has changed over those last 30 years. Obviously, it's grown incredibly. Technology has changed. We, you know, touching to all the different parts of the world. But you know, through that time, we've stayed true to some basic core guiding principles. You know, these you know, principles that were you know, there from the beginning with the learning model of you know, having young people learn through designing their own projects, to be following their interests and to follow their passion uh, in the things they're working on, to build community, to have a supportive community uh, that's going to be working together, both the young people working with each other and with mentors and staff, and to have an environment of respect and trust. And our comments today, we want to focus especially on that fourth guiding principle about an environment of respect and trust, which we see is so important uh, to the workings of the clubhouse and the success of the clubhouse. And I was thinking about this recently uh, by some of the things that were happening in recent months. Earlier this year, in fact, it was on March 7th, it was 10 days after Russia invaded Ukraine. I got an email from a Ukrainian educator who I'd never met before. Uh, and she wrote to me. Her name was uh, Alicia Blasi. And Alicia wrote to me. She said, you know, I'm a Ukrainian teacher, a mother, and a children's poet. Now it's a very hard time for my native country. I decided to write to you to ask help to create the largest wave of kindness. And she went on to explain, she said there are a lot of different types of waves in the world, sound waves, light waves. She said, we need a new type of wave, a wave of kindness, where she said, there's so many people on the planet who need help. What can each of us do? How can we create our own wave of kindness to send to those people? And she was reaching out, she said, maybe we can realize it on scratch. You know, you can make a beautiful animation, a kind message, or simply draw a peaceful pe picture. So it's reaching out to say, how can we use some of the technology we have, you know, the Scratch programming language, an online community, to help create these waves of kindness around the world. So we talked with our colleagues at the Scratch Foundation that now you know, organize the Scratch, and they created a special you know, studio in Scratch that was called Spreading Kindness. And within days of posting this in March, there were literally thousands of projects. They were all talking about different ways you could support you know, other people and to spread kindness and how you could sort of reach out to people who are going through difficult times and do something to support them and all different strategies you could use. And then some of them were specifically supporting the people of Ukraine who were going through such a difficult time. And of course, some of them was using these, making great animations. They were certainly learning great technical skills, but more important, they're learning about sort of sharing their feelings and supporting one another and how they can help one another. Uh, and we was very touched to see this outpouring from young people around the world, from all over the world, reaching out on this particular case in Ukraine, but also just how to help support and spread kindness around the world. And I remember talking to Alicia. She was also touched at this outpouring. And we talked about it, and she was very well aware that just these scratch projects were not going to end the war in Ukraine. But you know, as she said, she said, this is what we need as a start. And we talked about it that everybody could just send a ripple of kindness. They could add together into a wave of kindness. And over time, it could lead to a culture of kindness. And we agreed that any long-term strategy to end the hatred and aggression and authoritarianism in the world would rely on a couple things. It would rely upon involving the next generation, as this was doing, and of creating a culture of creativity and kindness. And that's you know, what was really happening you know, you know, with what we're seeing here. And for me, it was very you know, great to see that. But I also was you know, thinking about how, for me, it really relates to what we see in the Clubhouse Network. You know, that I think when I go around, I see the really you know, successful clubhouses. They are places that are cultures of creativity and kindness. And we saw this story from Australia. You know, the, the reaching out the support of the Clubhouse Network. There's no better example of sending these ripples of kindness <laughs> and adding together into a wave of kindness. So I think it's something that, for me, it sort of does build upon this fourth guiding principle you know, of the, you know, creating an environment of respect and trust that can support this culture of creativity 
and kindness. So Natalie was really the driving force. As we were doing these guiding principles, she was insisting we have to have a guiding principle around respect and trust. And to say the first clubhouse came first and you know, Stina Cook was one of the people, Noah Southall, there were others who were really contributing and community. We were all right away from the beginning working with community groups, what do you need? And, but then it was like trying to articulate that um, a little bit into it and like how do we explain to others what, what are these principles? And we talked with Stina and others for many hours and I was very insistent that there need to be one that explicitly talked about creating a community of trust and respect. And sometimes we, you know, we get inspired by people who inspire us and sometimes we get inspired when we see something that's unjust or unfair or goes against our values. And one thing I was remembering was when I first came to MIT, there was this innovative project at a public school um, with kids of diverse races and cultures and going in there and I was in grad school and it was so exciting. There was the first programmable Lego and kids were so excited to come in this room and they could create what they wanted. But there was this one group of first graders and when they came in, they were so curious, but the teacher sometimes, and it was certain kids that she would target really unfairly and unjustly say, go in the corner, sit facing the corner when they came in. And I guess they did something, but a lot of us know now and, um, the research on the inequity of discipline where certain groups based on often youth of color are targeted in very young ages. And this is what I was seeing. I didn't know about it you know, at the time, decades ago, but I saw it firsthand that certain kids were told to sit in the corner and I was trying to figure out what I could do. So as soon as I could, I would go over and start to invite them in but it still troubled me. I wish I had done more. And so that's when I was thinking of, okay, we're gonna create this new space, but we need to be really clear that young people, no matter what age and what background are treated with respect and vice versa, that the staff and the people in that room were also treated with trust and respect. And, but again, it's easy to say that and then it's how do you put it into practice? And again, like I was going to a session, Jose, Kevin, Eric, and others yesterday of how they do with games and creativity. There's all these different ways, and that's what we'd like to talk about. But again, all of you know, how do you do that? And we're going to be talking to you to share your experience. How do you create this environment of trust and respect? I know designing the very first clubhouse, really trying to just design the space was really an important element to how to design a space for, 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 for to do support and environment. Yeah, of so trust we and mentioned the uh, the green table, but that this is a picture in the top left, the green table. And you might see someone in the foreground on the front left, that's Steve um, O over there on the board. Let's have a hi. <laughs> one, of, <laughs> one of the first members and um, alumni, you know, and now contributing back as a very wise board member who's gone on with his career, taking his passion, making it a successful career, and then sharing his advising back. So you can just see one really important thing, even though it's called the computer clubhouse, there's no computers on that center table that's a green table. And when we wrote in that first paper, we were trying to articulate this, talking about it like a village green. And like Gail was saying, you know, it takes a village to raise and support a clubhouse. And I think that that idea of people coming together to eat, to share, to create and connect is just at the heart of everything. Oh yeah, and then I'll just like, I decide that on the, the Reach Festival that Jeff Arthur and others lead at the clubhouse, one of my favorite entries, 2018, was this documentary from the Puerto 18 clubhouse in Buenos Aires. And it was called um, La Mesa Verde, and it was like myth or truth or reality. What is the mystery of the green table? How does so much creativity come out of this? And like this, they interview different people in their clubhouse to talk about the mystery of the green table and why so much creativity and collaboration happens around it. And she said, you know, it has a vibe that's different from any other table. So anyway, if you get a chance to check it out, but I just love seeing that. Yeah, as we were talking and preparing this thing about the use of space, and at the opening reception, I, I, I talked to Shoah from Jordan and was remembering a trip that I took to the uh, clubhouse in Amman. It was quite a while ago now. And how, how struck I was by the space there. Uh, there's a picture from the clubhouse in Amman. Uh, and there's so many things just about in a space that supports 
uh, an environment of respect and trust. So you see a green table snuck on the, on the right-hand side there, you see the green table. But you see everything, just you know, the, the way that there are I, things on the walls to inspire you and the, to, to get, give you a sense of welcome. And I remember I was invited to Jordan, was at the time the, the government of Jordan was starting a network of, of community centers that were called knowledge stations. But the knowledge stations weren't so successful. They weren't attracting many people from the community. But the clubhouse in Amman was really successful. Lots of young people were going there. So they asked me you know, about to come and take a look and say, why is it that the clubhouse is being so much more successful? So I visited one of the knowledge stations. There's a photo of it. <laughs> and I think you can see right away, you know, when we talk about you know, having a, a village green, a green table to gather around, the rows were packed tightly together. You couldn't even sort of, when someone's working there, you couldn't even cut across to see what they're doing. You couldn't work together at the same computer. Everything is just facing forward, so the idea is just to be looking at the front of the room rather than one another. You see the walls are bare, you know, nothing that's going to inspire you or welcome you into the room. So just the contrast between that and what we saw here. Now, you know, and of course, it's not just the physical attributes. Another thing that I loved about my visit to the Jordan Clubhouse was visiting with the mentors and staff. They had a wonderful community of mentors. Even after the clubhouse closed, they stayed after hours and were working with one another and sharing ideas with one another. And you could just see the ways that they were enjoyed spending time with each other, the way they enjoyed spending time with the youth, and were sort of you know, supporting the whole community. And to me, that was something that really you know, that leads to the, the environment of respect and trust that led to the success of the clubhouse. So the, the space can be conducive and you know, the chairs that you can roll around and see what other people are working on. Also, the way that events are structured. So the network staff has done so much to design the Teen Summit. And each year, the, the whole way that the Teen Summit is organized really helps create that global community among the youth that come together, too. And this is in contrast. There's a, a movie about a different kind of gathering of teens from around the world that was a competition. And it actually broke my heart watching and comparing that to what happens at the Teen Summit, because in that video, you see that the youth aren't even talking to each other from other countries because they're so focused on their pitch and their competition. They're just talking to themselves. And it's like that opportunity, but the way that the network staff and others and all of you who've come to help out at it over the years, Chi, Shoa, and Fran, and others from clubhouses around the world, Delisa, um, the, the way that it's structured is for kids from different countries to collaborate together and then ending in a project fair. So the way you design activities can also really help build community and the, the way that the young people within the different tracks start to bond with each other as they're creating together. And research shows the best way to create community across different differences is through working on projects together. And so this is just like such a beautiful contrast that I wanted to mention that as the way that activities are structured can also help people feel safe and help people form connections. Yeah, as we were thinking about these examples, one thing that, that's sort of clear to us is that this fourth guiding principle of an environment of trust and respect sets the foundation for all of the others. And that's one thing we just see over and over, that the, the first three principles, you really can't put them into practice without the fourth one. I mean, if you just look at you know, the first, of, you know, learn through designing projects. You know, if you're in a place, we want young people to be you know, experimenting and trying new things. And when you experiment and try new things, things go wrong. And if you're in an environment where somebody's going to ridicule you or make fun of you when things go wrong, you're not going to try it again. So that environment of respect and trust is so important for young people to do creative work, to be willing to try new things, feel OK if things go wrong, and then iterate and try new things over and over. And then we'll go quickly because we no, want to make okay. sure you have no, time. Okay, you're okay. About okay. The, the, well, the with interest. Themselves. Okay, yes, all right. <laughs> I want to make sure to have time for you all to talk about this too. But um, the, the way that we design the technology too, so when we were designing the Scratch programming language, um, we wanted to make sure that it was encouraging that kind of tinkering and trying different things. And so we really designed it that it's almost impossible to get an error message. It's really, and that's what we hear from young people, is that they've gained 
creative confidence by being able to try things, see what happens. And like they said, sometimes it does what you, you know, didn't expect and you're like, okay, I'm gonna change it. Or sometimes you're like, oh, that's cool. I didn't realize that would happen. I'm gonna build on that. So just the whole way that the tools are designed to really support young people feeling safe and feeling like their ideas can be tried out and see what happens. And so many of them, that's how they say they learn, not from the tutorials we design, it's from trying different things, looking at other people's projects. And it's the same thing in the clubhouses that you're creating this environment where young people feel safe to try out their own ideas and interests, follow them, and be able to create something that they can share with others. Yeah, and I think you know, that foundation also is important in the second principle about following your interests. Well, again, it takes a lot of trust and respect to allow someone else to follow their interests, because you don't quite know where it's gonna go, and different young people are gonna go in different directions. So you really need to have you know, trust in, where, in their you know, being able to identify, follow their interests, and to support them in doing it. And I think that is something that we see over and over, that we know that, it's, that people are gonna work longer and harder and persist in the face of challenges, and, and, and make deeper connections to ideas. If they are work on things they're interested in and passionate about, that only is gonna work if you have the trust in them to be able to follow their interest. And we just sort of see that, you know, even in a session yesterday, you know, we were talking about that with the variety of you know, coordinators, and we just saw lots of examples of, of how they support young people's interests, but also follow their own interests. I think it's something that's important for coordinators to follow, you know, following your interests is so important. We just saw that over and over. And then the last one is sort of building a community. And obviously, you know, we sort of see that the clubhouse is so important to connect everyone together, young people, mentors, staff, and a community. And that's only gonna be successful if the people are trusting and respecting one another in, in the way that they set up the community. It's not enough just to put a bunch of people in the same space or even to set up some collaborations. It has to be done in an environment of respect and trust. And it's been great to just see the way that We've seen this happen in lots of clubhouses around the world. Uh, actually, I know we're running late, but I'm gonna give you the example <laughs> okay. anyway. Okay. Because uh, it's like I know, like a, a number of years ago, I was thinking about this as I was preparing to visit a clubhouse in Costa Rica, where I was, as I was reviewing this, I really was thinking about. It. I, I went down and, and found the, the quote from the clubhouse coordinator there, who was just finishing his first year at the clubhouse, and he said, "When I started." I focus on helping members learn about the technology. But by the end of the year, I realized that the clubhouse is like a family. What's most important is that everyone cares about one another and helps one another. If that happens, everything else will work out. And for me, that was like the best. <laughs> yeah, that's the way I felt as well. And it was, in his own words, he was saying, you better have you know, that fourth guiding principle, and then everything else will work out. Uh, and we've seen that in other clubhouses. We've been inspired by so many of you and other coordinators and staff members we met over the years. So now I was going to talk one. The, actually, I was thinking about her at annual conferences, Laversa Sullivan, who is one we always look forward to at early conferences. Unfortunately, she's no longer with us. Now do I say a little bit about Laversa? So Ms. Laversa was yeah one of the first coordinators. She basically had a clubhouse before clubhouses and then became part of the network from the beginning. And we've learned so much, and through Jalisa Trapp, who um, was a member in her clubhouse, then took over and became the coordinator, now a grad student at MIT, and also, as many of you went and heard, is contributing to the youth activism initiative at the clubhouse. And Ms. Laversa said, I strongly felt if someone didn't step up and take away the mystery of computers, then people of color would not get involved in the technology profession. My mother always told us to lift as we climb. She always told us to give back. And that uh, lifting as we climb, I learned about it from Jalisa and others and just the, the whole way that the clubhouse was led and really like Jalisa has said, talked about how everything that she really helped impart to the members that when you learn something, share it with two more people. And that's one of the ways that we lift others. Also, just whenever a new member came in, would always say, hey, why don't you show them around so that there was right away that sense of belonging. And then Jalisa and uh, her, that was when she was leading the clubhouse in Tacoma, and she um, has written about this also, about just creating community values, having the young people themselves 
develop the community guidelines that they feel like are right so that from the beginning they're invested. So there's just a lot of different ways. So we wanted to give a little bit of time for you to be able to turn to the person next to you because we know it's not easy to create that culture of trust and respect and often when kids aren't respected in other places or there's really difficult things, it's, you know, any of us will lash out when we're feeling upset. So how do you bring it back to, you know, repair and create that culture? So it could be something that you've done just in the environment or other ways that you've created or tried to create or that you've experienced an environment of trust and respect. So if you could turn to someone next to you and just share an example, that would be great. We thought we could just share some with the whole group. And, and Jeff has agreed to go around and to, you know, if people are, are willing to share some of the things you were thinking about, about the ways that you've helped support an environment of respect and trust, uh, you could, you know, Jeff is going to go around and try to get a few people to share some of their ideas. Oh, I think over there. We told Chef, Jeff, he can share some of his ideas, too. <laughs> Don't try to avoid eye contact, either. I will, look, I will put you on blast. <laughs> uh, Wendell, Gary, Indiana. Uh, one of the things that um, I came out of the middle schools, and I had a PD with this uh, principal, Kafele, and he talked about three non-negotiables when working with young people, and I've kind of adopted them. And so one he talked about was like nobody, having the teens be visible. So if there's a teen that's in there, making sure that everybody is visible. Mm -hmm. He says second was everyone having a voice. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that any time, like I always told him that it's not what you say, it's but how you say it. Mm -hmm. And even when they would grumble and I say, speak your mind, you know, so created that atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And then the third non-negotiable was a cultural identity. And so it's important in Gary because it's, the community's been so downtrodden over the decades and you can walk out and see the blight, and they're not as proud, they're not proud of the community that they reside in, and so it was really important to make sure that they understood the legacy of their community and had a sense of pride of that community. And, and, ha and incorporating those three elements, including the self-determination model, really helped foster a community. So when we have new members, we started out with about seven in April when I got hired, and now we're over 60, wow. you know, since <laughs> the opening. And so, and so that's what we do. And, and the learning model is so awesome because it, for African-American children, it, it really allows them to be themselves and the educational system wasn't designed for us anyway. Yeah. And so this allows them to be them, their authentic self, those that are motor, they dance, they play music, they get to move around. Some of them learn standing up, they're tactile learners, and this model really works well in our community. And so layering those things in has really had a tremendous effect and impact thus far just being open. Our grand opening was like 30 days ago, right? <laughs> but wow. it really has had a, a significant impact. So thank you all. Thank well, you. Thank you so much. Anyone else want to share? All the, OK, all the way across the room now. Right. <laughs> it's good. I hope Jeff got his steps in. Steps, steps, steps. <laughs> that, I think that's a great example. When Natalie said the need to put the, the principles into practice, and it's not always easy, but that's a great example of putting those principles into practice. I'm building on them. Hi, I'm uh, D Hop from Minneapolis, Minnesota. So, as me and brother Jaden was talking. Uh, we talked about something that this has naturally been passed down into us. Uh, and I told him, and he uh, co-signed with it, that my mom used to always say to me, uh, in order to gain respect, you have to give respect, mm -hmm. right? And so we were talking about how we just took something that's naturally in us that we lead inside of our spaces with our young people. So giving and getting respect is something uh, fortunately for us in our conversation that it's just been a natural part of our existence. Mm. So we lead with that inside the space. Yeah. Thank you. That's great.
that's the type of yeah. speaker. Jeff, would you, would you be willing to share, right before you told us about t shirt you got at one clubhouse recently that I thought was really relevant? <laughs> yeah, I'm actually going to um, have the coordinator talk about it. Because I okay. think, uh, so Megan, where's Megan at? Megan, Megan, Megan. <laughs> so I'm going to have Megan talk about the, uh, the failure wall. <laughs> I do like how we maximize the distance for Jeff to walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate it, y'all. Um, hi, I'm Megan from Las Vegas. Uh, ooh, ooh, all right. Uh, we in our clubhouse have uh, a wall, and it says failure is an option. Um, and that, yeah, our T-shirt right there. Um, before we came, because Jeff always throws out the failure wall, he calls it the failure wall. Um, so we had our teens make um, a shirt, a, a design around failure is an option. And when you see it, it, it is creepy because we are Vegas and we are creeps in Vegas. <laughs> and um, when you see it, there's like the, God, like the door is open and there's something peeking out. And I was like, what's with this door? And someone peeking out and they're like, well, that's doubt. And when doubt creeps in, yeah, so, so in Vegas, we actually celebrate our failures. We turn our failures into, it's just a jumping off point to something great, to something better. And, um, and so when a kid comes out and they try and it doesn't work out, we are like, oh my God, that's amazing. Let's print it out. Let's throw it up there and let's just do it. And when you go to our failure wall, you'll see like, Megan has like a gazillion because I'm, I'm a huge failure. And that's good though, but that's good because that means you tried, you weren't scared to try because we know you can't succeed, right? No one has ever done anything and succeeded. I mean, even like LeBron James, you think he was like, boop, right away? No, you have to practice and you have to work at it. Um, <laughs> you have to practice and you have to work at it. So we love our failure wall. We're epic failures in Vegas. And I hope you all become epic failures too because failure is an option and it should be celebrated. <laughs> Actually, we want to thank all of you. Just these few examples, again, are just part of the many inspirations that we keep getting from seeing what you're doing at all your clubhouses to put these ideas into practice. We hope to continue to learn more and just love the way that all of you are creating ripples of kindness that I know will help create a culture of creativity and kindness that we all need and help you know, influence the rest of the world. So thanks again to everyone. Thank you.